Welcome, everyone. My name is Xavier Ducroy. I'm the tech lead for the Tools team. I'm Tor Norby, and I'm the tech lead for Android Studio. Hi, I'm Jamal, the product manager on the Android DevTools team. And welcome. So last year, we launched Android Studio Beta. We appreciated your feedback during the development process, and we're happy to launch last December Android Studio 1.0. So since launch, the majority of our users have made the transition over to Android Studio. So if you haven't had the time, now's a good time to make that transition. Our team is fully focused on working on Android Studio, and we're constantly listening to your feedback, wanting to make the features that work best for you and your development environment. So when we launched Android Studio 1.0, we asked you developers, hey, what do you want? We did a survey, and this is what sort of panned out from those results. Number one. A lot of people asked about design tools. Number two, a faster emulator experience. Number three, indicate support. And number four, app testing. And we really appreciated hearing all this feedback so we can really prioritize our work to making sure we do the right stuff that works for you. So in this talk, we'll talk about three different types of tools that we've been working on for the last couple of months. We'll talk a little bit about design, a little bit about developing and test, and we'll cap it off with a demo showcasing the work that we've been working on in Android Studio. So design. So Chet talked about this a little bit in the What's New section. But as you know, we launched Material Design with Android 5.0. And I'm really excited about this Android Design Support Library, because what it allows you to do is really focus on your content. Instead of worrying about meeting the specs for material design, you can literally drag and drop these components into your application, and you're on your way to having a high quality application. And as we talked about before, we've included a few elements, things like the floating action button, the toolbars with motion. So that's the toolbar you see with a lot of Google apps that sort of expand and grow. Now that's for free. You can now drag that into your application. We've also included the snack bar, the navigation view, and text input. And of course, as always, it's backwards compatible. Meaning that uh, if you target an Android L and higher, you can still get that same material look and feel for all your previous applications. <laughs> and so vector images. So last year as well, we introduced vector drawables with Lollipop. Now, I don't know about you, it's really kind of painful to manage and update lots of raster images and bitmaps across different densities. And so soon with Android Studio, you can now import an SVG file or work directly with a vector drawable. And during build time, we will generate all the assets for you automatically. So if you're not aware, if you wanted to change an asset or, or some sizing, you just change the vector drawable, and we'll build that for, for the PNG asset. And a couple of things that, that this helps you with. So hopefully it saves you time and hassle in generating all these assets. And then lastly, hopefully decrease your APK size. In many cases, if you just include a vector drawable, you can add a tint to it, and it, increase, it, it, sorry, it decreases your APK size for most apps. And then lastly, for the visual design editors. So looking at the results of the survey, we thought about how do we help you design your application? We know a lot of you enjoy maybe working directly with XML. But for me, and a lot of developers, I like using visual tools to do visual elements of my application. So we pretty much looked at all the different files you have to work with, things like styles.xml, colors.xml, and came to the conclusion that, well, you know, we need to write it from scratch. And so what we're going to show you today are a few demos of the work we've been doing to make it easier for you to maintain your UI without having to solely rely on using XML to work with your UI elements. And so with that, I'll transition to Zap to talk a little bit about our development tools. Thank you, Jay. All right, so core to our strategy is our unified build system, right? So whether you're building from Studio, from the command line, or from your build server, you know, you're going to use a single build system, and that's based on Gradle. So since 1.0, we focused on a few items. Uh, the first one was correctness. And well, we fixed a lot of bugs first. And uh, a lot of those issues were around dependency management. Uh, for example, properly handling the test dependencies. When you have an application and a test that have the same dependency, you need to make sure to only package it once. There's a lot of corner cases there that we had to support, so we've done a lot of those. So if you had some issues, you can upgrade to a later version. 
Uh, we've also added support. Uh, we also fixed a lot of issues regarding the provided scopes. Uh, and uh, new in 1.3, we are adding support for optional dependencies in library projects. The, uh, the other thing that we are focusing a lot on right now is performance. And we know that's on a lot of your mind. And so uh, there's really two aspects to performance. The first one is just the build steps, right? Like the compilation steps, the DX steps, the packaging steps. So here we have a few different things going on. Uh, the first one is we have this new compiler called Jack. And Jack is a compiler that replaces DX and goes directly from Java source code to DEX file. Uh, we've already had a uh, first preview uh, a few months back. And so we'll have a new preview in 1.3 with both a new version of Jack and a new version of our plugin that offer incremental support when you're building. And uh, in some of our tests, we've seen you know, some good performance increase in that step, which is one probably of the, the steps that takes the longest time. Um, yes. <laughs> We're also looking at other steps that we are doing and improving them. So for example, the PNG cruncher is one that we fixed uh, starting with Build Tools 22. Um, we looked at it, and the old one, if you, did, you know, if you had about 500 PNGs in your application, and they need to be processed in order to be packaged with your application, especially if there are nine patches, um, 500 PNG could take like four seconds, and we're down to 400 milliseconds, so it's much better. And then finally, APT, which is the tool that packages all of your resources, create binary XML, and all of that. Uh, we are working heavily to actually make this step also incremental, because right now it always recombine, uh, recompile all of your resources. So that's the first aspect of performance. The second aspect is Gradle itself. And we know that right now, when you build, you get a feeling that it takes a long time to start up. And you know, it's like, what is going on, right? So, um, the thing that Gradle does when you start is it creates a model of your project. Of every single one of your module, it's going to create a model that contains all the variants created from build, flavor, uh, build types and product flavors. It's going to create the task to build every single one of your variants. It's going to resolve all of the dependencies for every single one of your variants. And it's, like, it's, it's a lot of work. right? Uh, and then if you have custom logic, it's going to run that custom logic every time. And you know, your custom logic could tweak the, the model, could tweak the task, add new tasks, and do things like that. So let's look at an example. Here we have a project that has 10 modules with 25 variants each. Uh, on the first line, the help task uh, does nothing build related. It just output a static text. Uh, and then the second line, assemble one variant. Uh, so by assemble here, uh, you know, we actually run that benchmark with the dry run mode, where it actually skips all the build steps, like the compilation, the packaging. So we really look at you know, the, um, the time that Gradle itself takes. You know? And you can see that on those two lines, it's the same exact amount of time. And that's because Gradle is a little bit, let's say, not very smart here. It doesn't really know that the help task is not really build related. And so it's still going to build all of that model. Uh, and then on the third line, we are running uh, every variant of every module. And that takes a little bit more time, because in the end, you still have a, a bigger task graph that needs to be prepared and, and run through. Um, and then the two columns that we have, so the first column is Gradle plugin 1.0 with Gradle 2.2.1, which is our minimum requirement. And the second one is 1.2. Uh, with also Gradle 2.2.1. And you can see here that we actually we are not going in the right direction here, right? Um, you know, and that's because we are doing more things, right? I mentioned a lot about you know, more dependency management check to support test and scope, and that's just more work equals you know, longer time, right? And that's really not what we want to do. So we work very closely with Gradleware, uh, the company behind Gradle, and, um, you know, to solve the problem. And so we did a lot of optimization on our end with Gradle one, uh, the plugin 1.3 and with Gradle 2.4, which was just released like a few weeks ago. And so the numbers already look much better, right? Oh. <laughs> Let's look at another example. This project here is a single module with 400 variants. Now, this is really a corner case. Not a lot of people will have 400 variants in their project, I hope. Um, and clearly, when you look at the time, it's, it's pretty bad, right? Definitely some scalability issue. So if we look at the result, that's even better. So if you notice, though, in that case, in, in both of those cases, right, if we still run only help or a single variant, that's still about the same amount of time. right? We haven't solved that issue of Gradle still building the whole model. 
and so we've been, you know, for the past year or so, we've been working very closely with the Gradle team to fix that problem. They've been working on a new API to build plugin uh, that will solve this. So, on top of that, we are on top of those new APIs. We are building a next generation plugin, um, and the goal here is to have Gradle be more involved in the model that our plugin creates. Basically, Gradle is going to manage that model for us. It's going to manage the variants and, all of, and the task and all of that in order to do less. The goal here is to make Gradle do only what's needed to build what you requested to build. And then, because Gradle also managed that model, it can cache it and make incremental update to the cache when only some, some things have changed. Uh, and then finally, we, it will also open the door for more optimization. Uh, for example, right now, if you have a multi-module project, every single module is um, evaluated you know, sequentially. There's no parallelism, so you know, that's something we can improve. So let's look at the new numbers. That's even better, right? And what you notice here is that when you run just the help task on a small project, it's those 0.9 seconds is really what it takes, you know, when you run that from the command line to start Gradle, have it communicate with the daemon, output the text, and then quit. It's basically do doing nothing less. And when you start building only a single variant, it's just a little bit more time. And the, the difference between building a single variant and building all the variants is actually bigger than in the previous case, because that's the case where suddenly we do a lot more. The interesting point, oh, uh, big caveat here, there is no caching in here, right? We, we, they haven't implemented yet caching, so you can see that those numbers will get even smaller when, you know, when you're building all the variants and the model has been cached, all we have to do is reload it from the cache, and so that will be even faster. Um, the interesting point here is that when you're building from Studio, when you do deploy, you're actually building a single variant from a single module plus potentially dependencies. So it's really the best you know, scenario where you only have Gradle do the minimum that it needs to do, and so that will really speed up your build when you're developing from within Studio. Um, so what's the deal with the new plugin? Um, the first thing to know is that you know, it's new APIs. The DSL will be, so the DSL is the language that you use to write the build.gradle file. Uh, it will be slightly different. And that's because Gradle, you know, as I said earlier, kind of manage part of the model. So we have to use a DSL that works you know, with those APIs. Uh, we're going to ship that as a preview in 1.3 uh, in a few weeks. It's not part of the current 1.3 release that we did today. Uh, just a week or two, and we'll release a preview. And then from then on, we'll keep releasing it as a preview alongside 1.3, 1.4, et cetera, uh, still as a preview alongside the old plugin that will still be there. And then later this year, that will replace officially the current plugin. Uh, if you're using Studio, whether you're using the old plugin or the new plugin doesn't matter. They work the same with Studio. Studio doesn't care. It's the same you know, model that's exposed to the ID. So that's on the performance side. Um, let's talk a little bit about data binding. You uh, probably heard about that already in the previous session. Uh, so we have data binding. Uh, it's purely build time, right? All you have to do is set up your build system, and then it just generates the code for you, and then it just works. Uh, there is a support library also that's part of that. Um, so right now, it's part of a separate plugin. Uh, and then hopefully for 1.3, we will include that in the main plugin so that you don't even have to go and install another plugin. So for now, though, you have to install that plugin. It's available on JSONter. Uh, you know, just go, you install that plugin, then you start adding data mining elements in your resources, and that's it. It adds the dependency for you, nothing to do. You know, it will just do what it has to do. All right, NDK C++ support. Uh, so. Uh, Gradle has support for native support now. And so we are building a new integration in Gradle based on that. And uh, because it's somewhat tied to the new component model that you know, the, those new API I just talked about, that's going to be tied to the next generation plugin we're working on. Um, and that will allow us to, you know, that, that integration in, in, uh, in Gradle will allow us to have a really good integration in Studio where everything that Studio needs to know about you know, your project for editing will come from Gradle, and then we'll have a great experience there. And so for the experience in Studio, we really wanted to provide like, the best possible experience for editing and debugging. And so we partners with JetBrain to package in Studio their brand new uh, ID for C and C++ directly in Studio, and it will be free for Android development. Uh, I don't know if you... <laughs> we did not want to start from scratch. They have a great solution, and we are just you know, offering it to you. 
Um, and you have full debugging, full refactoring. You know, it's, it's really a great tool. All right, so let's talk a little bit about testing now. So uh, since 1.0, we added a few features for testing. Uh, the first one that we added was unit test support. So um, what I mean by unit test support here is you know, unit tests that work directly natively on the desktop JVM rather than having to be compiled into an APK and sent to the device. That's to you know, speed up round tripping or fixing your bugs, uh, your, your bugs and your tests and you know, seeing results. Um, the, the big point here is that you know, this is not meant to run Android platform code on the desktop JVM. You know, we do provide a custom Android Dodger where you can go and mock everything. Like the, the normal Android Dodger actually has a lot of class that are final, so we kind of strip the final so that you can go and mock them. Uh, but you have to mock what you use. So it's strictly for your business logic. Uh, it's up to you to figure out how much you want to mock or not. The goal is not to replace RoboElectric here. Uh, but if you want to use that, just start putting your test in source test Java. There's you know, unit test specific dependencies, and you can just add that, and then you can run your test. The other thing that we added in Gradle um, in 1.3 is external text, test project. We had a lot of developers telling us that they wanted more flexibility in how they organize their app and their test, and they wanted to make the test in a different module, so you can now do that. Uh, that test project um, you know, target a specific module and a specific variant of that module. There's no support for flavors or variant in a test module. If you want to test multiple variants of your same application, you have to use different test modules for now. Um, and those features is really like part of an overarching story of you know, improving testing story on Android. You know, so it goes from Studio and Gradle having better support at the project level and in the tools, you know, having better um, testing libraries, you know, Espresso, uh, the Android testing library, uh, the unit test support, and all of that. Then the test lab that we announced this morning, all the way to what we have in play, uh, the Play Console about you know, testing your application. Um, and you know, our goal is to make it very easy for you to write tests, run them, right? It's like, that's very important too, uh, to help you make you know, high quality application. Uh, part of making high quality application is also you know, performance. And so we're investing a lot and in adding things into Studio. Uh, since 1.0, we added a live CPU and memory profiling. Uh, and then in 1.3, we're announcing a new uh, viewer to view your memory heap. Uh, we'll have a demo of that later. Uh, emulator. So uh, we've mostly been focused on stability in order to enable performance. Now, if properly configured and running on a compatible system, the emulator can actually be fast. The problem is making sure that most people can run the properly configured uh, emulator. And so uh, we've been looking a lot at adding, helping you configure it. So for example, Studio out of the box you know, will now install, uh, download and install Haxum for you in order to run it you know, at native speed on x86. Uh, the AVD manager will automatically configure it for you. And then the other thing that we've done recently is we fixed literally thousands of issues in the GL renderer, the hardware GL renderer. Uh, because if you're forced to move to the software renderer because your graphic driver isn't compatible, the experience is much worse. So we've done a lot of improvement there um, in order to help you basically run as fast as it can be. And then specifically for M, we're adding some new features like the uh, fingerprint emulation where you can you know, add fingerprint, register fingerprint, and then use them when your application requests them. Talking about emulator, uh, later this year, we're going to launch a new emulator specifically for Android Auto. So it will be a head unit emulator. You will be able to take either an Android, like a phone emulator or a physical device, just connect them to your machine, and then you know, the head unit will basically show what you would see on a car uh, with Android Auto. All right, and I leave it to Tor for demos. All right, who wants to see the C++ support? Yeah. All right, can we switch to, yes, we already have. So uh, this is C++, you remember pointers? <laughs> so what you're looking at here is a game that's been written in C++, and as you can see, the source editor is fully aware of that. It's uh, warning us that these include statements are actually unused, because none of the symbols in the include are actually used in the source file. So I can invoke the action to just clean that up, and that gets rid of that. Um, 
I can use the normal navigation uh, commands. So with you know, F12, I can filter and jump to the right method that I'm looking for. Uh, I can use the action to jump to related symbol, which will navigate to the header file prototype. And I can use that to jump back. Yay. Uh, I can use the action to jump to uh, a super method. I can uh, also use find usages. right? So if I do find usages on this symbol right here, you can see it's doing a non-textual, an actual accurate search through the symbols. And related to uh, find usages, of course, is refactoring. So I can do a rename on this method right here, get instance. Let's call it get singleton. And when I do that, the IDE it looks at everything and discovers that, hey, there's some textual occurrences. Do you want those as well? So I can pull up the show usages window. Uh, here I can see that we have some text files that are you know, using this API, but I don't actually want to include those in the refactoring. So I'll just delete it. And then we have all the accurate matches here. So I can just apply the refactoring, and voila, change has been made in C++. All right. Uh, as you can see here, the editor is also doing things like telling me that this symbol is unused. Actually, let's just use it instead. So we have code completion. Uh, and I can use the normal stuff you, you're used to from Java pro programming, where you type some of the capital letters. So if I type O, P, M, you know, it's matching on pointer move. And I can then insert that and perform, you know, insert the, whatever the parameters are that I need for this method call. Uh, furthermore, I can select some expressions, and I can extract this into a variable. Uh, it picks a suitable name for me. Or I can go and inline it back into the code, and it'll do that. Uh, and take a look at this here. I have two local variables. I can actually extract this into a method. And even though I have multiple outputs from this method, that's not a problem in C++ because it can just do pass by reference. So if I now jump in here, you can see that we have the, the variables passed in. Um, so the key thing here is that this is not just a port of all the Java features to C++. They have a lot of unique C++ features as well. So for refactoring, for example, I can extract into macros. I can extract type defs and so forth. So uh, there's a lot of C++ features I could get into, and I could spend the whole demo on that, on code styles and formatting, on intentions, inspections. Uh, we have a debugger. We support GDB and LLDB. Uh, I just want to show one more thing, and this is specifically for those of you doing JNI development uh, with the Android NDK. So let me jump into uh, my JNI file. So here is a JNI call. So if I do find usages on this method, you can see that it's highlighting not just the C code, but also the native declaration in Java, as well as calls to that Java method. <laughs> and notice that there's this little icon that you might not be able to see, but this is for jumping between related symbols. So just like I can jump between an implementation and a header file, I can use the same keystroke to jump between the JNI method and the declaration. And look what happens if I break this signature. If I type in some random thing here and I go back to Java, you can see now we know in the editor this is no longer a valid binding. And this is actually a really good way for me to create new native methods. I just make the method declaration that I want. Let's make it a little more interesting and put some parameters into it, like a string and an integer array. And now there's a quick fix, which will create the right JNI binding, insert it into the C code, Okay. And you can see we're also inserting things like, hey, we're passing you a Java Unicode string. We'll convert that into a const care for C, ditto for erase, and then don't forget to release them when you're done. So we hope this feature will make it a lot easier to work with JNI. Uh, now I want to jump over to discuss editing Java. So uh, let's see. Today, we are releasing, actually, I think we've already released it. There's a new version of the support library, and it has you know, the design library and so forth. But, uh, there are now 13 new annotations you can use in your code to basically uh, catch more bugs. And we've used these annotations in the Android framework and the support libraries to catch your bugs as well. So uh, first of all, there's, a, there's some threading annotations. So here we're saying that this method is a worker thread method. That means we expect it to be called in a worker thread. And we've already annotated the framework with the knowledge that view code has to be invoked in the UI thread. So we can instantly tell here, hey, you're calling a UI thread method from a worker thread, that's bad. 
And you don't have to go and put worker thread on your own code, because we've already done it. For example, async task. If you make an async task, and you do something in the doing background method, notice there's no annotation here, we still flag this code as, well, this one is supposed to be called on the main thread, and this one, you know, UI thread. So uh, the, that's the threading annotations. There's the size annotation. Here you can say things like, well, I want this string to be a certain length or this array to be a certain size, maybe max, maybe an exact number, maybe a min. Or you could even say multiple of. So if you take an array and you want it to be like XYZ coordinates, you could say multiple of three. Uh, so here, for example, I'm passing a string that's too long for this constraint. And here we're passing an array that is of the wrong size. So similar to size, we have int and range, uh, int range and float range annotations. Here you can say that you know, this value needs to be in this constrained range. This is really useful for things like alpha, right? So it turns out that for image view, the alpha value is an integer between 0 and 255. But for view, it's a floating point between 0 and 1. So what we're doing here is I thought opacity, 128, that should be half opacity, right? That's correct for image view, but not for button. And so you know, this basically tells you that you're passing a parameter that's not in the right range. Um, check result basically tells you can use this to tell client code that they better do something with the return value. Uh, and call super says that if anyone overrides your method, they better invoke uh, super.method. Uh, and then there's color int, which is used to say this integer represents a color. And we'll see that a little bit later. Last but not least, requires permission. So this lets you say that a certain method requires a particular permission, or maybe all of a set of permissions, or any of a set of permissions. So we've already annotated the framework with some of these uh, permission requirements. So for example, location manager. If I'm trying to invoke get last known location, we will say that, hey, you don't hold the right permissions for this method call. Would you like to add them? Yes, I would. So there's a quick fix for that. Uh, and so I can say, please add the find location to my manifest. And so I do that, but sadly, there's still the red line. What does that line mean? Well, if you watch the keynote this morning, M is basically now supporting uh, revocable permissions. So here, because my app is targeting M, this method can throw a security exception, even though I specifically requested the permission in the manifest. So what I should do is actually check for the permission first. So we, we track that I'm not actually doing that check, and there's a quick fix to add it which basically looking at their permission requirements will add the right checks and also suggest what you should do if you really want to ask the user with the callback and all that good stuff. Right. So that's the static analysis. We're also taking that into the debugger. So here I am in the middle of debugging this code. Uh, and you can see here, I'm looking at this variable here, flags. It's a local variable, and the value is 5. What does 5 mean? Anyone? Well, let's ask the debugger. So I can right click on this and say, view as Android type integer. And when I do that, <laughs> so for those of you who didn't clap, let me show you what just happened. Uh, <laughs> basically, this local variable, we, we trace this to this field. We look at the field. We see that it has a getter. We see that the getter has the type annotation. The type annotation says that we have these possible constants, and we check the constants and find the ones that match, and that's how we produce this. So that's pretty neat. <laughs> and this is not just for type defs. For example, here I have another integer field, which you know, minus 65,408. Uh, I don't know if that rings a bell, but I can ask it to do a type conversion on this one. Ah, oh, it's a color. Because Color int was the annotation that we saw earlier, and that's been an annotated. Text ID is another one of those integers, and I can convert this one, and it figures out, well, that's a resource string, and it corresponds to this specific string object. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a new feature. I hope you'll find that useful. Uh, now I'm going to show you data binding very, very briefly. So here I am in an activity. And this activity, I actually have a layout called main activity in my project. If you ever made a studio project, you probably have one too. Uh, and so we, the, the Gradle plugin actually creates this class, main activity binding, which takes all the fields in your layout and produces getters. So you can see, or actually field accessors. So you can see here I have something called robot list. I forgot to tell you, the data binder is done here. Here we're actually associating this activity with this layout. So once I've done that, we get these magic fields. And these are just IDs in my layout. If I do go to declaration, I jump right into my layout. You can see it's just a recycler view. And robot list is just the ID. So if I change that ID to something else and I go back, you can see now the editor knows, hey, that's not a right field on this class anymore. This is a dynamically generated code. So I can go and 
you know, fix it. And there's code completion on this as well, of course. Um, so that's, that's the binder. This handles all the fine view by ID binding for you. You no longer have to do that. You get getters and setters, and everything is handled in a thread safe, uh, correct way. Um, so if I look in the layout file, you can see here that there's a bunch of new tags. I can create variables, and I can even do imports, and I can you know, alias them so I have a simpler thing to refer to in my code below. And then in the layout, I can do things like this. I can take methods. Like the on, all the setters and getters on the views are accessible here as properties, and likewise on the activity. Uh, and I can also compute values, so I can bind the Android text attribute to this expression, which is using the variable I declared above and mapping to properties in the activity. So this takes out a lot of the plumbing code, uh, and I can't actually do this justice in 90 seconds, uh, but it's available now, so please try it. All right. So now I want to talk about performance for a second. So um, as Zav showed in the screenshot, you can go and capture performance snapshots here now in the Android view to, from your connected device. And once you do that, we basically show the performance data files here in the captures view. So you can basically accumulate them here for later analysis or if you want to compare two different captures. So let me first open up the allocation tracker. So here I can see that for this capture, Thread one was responsible for most of the RAM or most of the allocations, and I can start drilling in here to see what was happening, uh, and I can find that well, it looks like full screen activity is doing something bad, right? It's calling a lot of string builder stuff with text view. Uh, we also have a way to show that as a sunburst chart. So if I invoke that, you can see we get this little nice chart uh, below here, and I can sort by, for example, size or count. And we also have this other uh, layout representation of the data. So you can use this and basically drill over to see what's going on with your allocations. Uh, we also can, you can also grab a, a heap dump from your app, or maybe one of your customers sends you one, and, and, you, know, and you can ask for this if you want to find out what's going on. So uh, you no longer have to convert your HPROF files. We read them directly now. And so all I have to do is click it to open it. And let me get myself some more room. I'm using really large fonts so you can see. So here we have several columns. And the most important one, maybe, is the retained size column. So if I sort by descending order of retained size, this is telling me the cumulative amount of memory I could save if I could get rid of these objects. So here you can see we have a lot of bitmaps. And we, when I select the class, I get an instance view on the right. And here we're using the debugger UI to basically you can now inspect objects from the heap dump as if you were debugging them and look at the values. And perhaps the most important part here is the reference tree below. So this is showing you all the incoming references to this object. And we're always sorting it so that the, the, the nearest garbage collection route is the first field. So look what happens when I start expanding the first child here. You see the depth column? This is counting down to the nearest GC route as I'm going down. And so here I found it. Basically. This is the static instance that is causing all the chain of pointers to my object and keeping it in memory. So if you have a memory leak and you want to get rid of it, or if you're wondering where's most of the memory coming, this is, an, I think, an invaluable tool. And this is now available in the 1.3 preview. All right, let's talk about uh, developer services. So first of all, let me just show you that I'm logged into my Google account in the upper right corner. That's going to become relevant in a second. So I can open up the project structure dialog here. And you can see the module list that you're used to seeing is now below this new developer services section. So here we're integrating various uh, developer services. So for example, there's GCM, there's authentication, analytics, and ads. Most of these are just adding a dependency on the Play Services library. But we've fleshed out the analytics integration in a bit more detail. So uh, now I can basically say that I want to add analytics to my project. When I do that, because I'm logged in, otherwise I would say, please log in first. It's now made a connection to the, the Google Analytics uh, console. It's pulling down the Google Anal Analytics projects associated with my account. I can choose it. It fetches the right tracker ID. And when I say OK, it now goes and creates this analytics tracker class in my project. This is very similar to the code that you would find online if you go to Google Analytics' documentation that says what to do. Uh, it also creates an app tracker file, which records the tracker ID for my project. Please don't use it. Um, 
And so now there's this class that you then will have to initialize from your context and, of course, to call back to whenever you want to record an analytics event. So this is something we're planning to do a lot more of. We're going we're gonna to build out more services and, and so forth, but uh, we think this is a pretty useful start. So let us know how this works for you. Um, we've also done something to help, uh, help you stay up to date on all the SDK components that we're releasing. So uh, in the past, with the old SDK manager, you had to regularly open it and say, is there anything new for me? Well, we're now using the same mechanism that we push IDE notifications up to to also notify that there's new SDK components. So here it's telling me, hey, there's a new M preview platform. Uh, and I can now click to use the IDE patching mechanism to update this. We've also ported the SDK manager so that it's now fully integrated with the IDE with sort of a new refresher. Yes, I agree. New fresh IDE uh, UI on it that I can then use to install stuff. And so hopefully this will make it easier to stay up to date with all the stuff that we are releasing. OK, so everything I've showed you today is going to be in 1.3. Now, um, the, it turns out the C++ support is not in the first preview. It's, we didn't make it, but it'll be in the next couple of weeks. Next couple of weeks, it'll be in the next preview build. Uh, but everything else I've showed you is in 1.3 preview. Now I'm going to show you a couple of things that are coming in uh, upcoming versions. So the first thing is the theme editor. So this is the styles.xml file from, for the I.O. scheduling application. Right? It's pretty complicated. And this is just one of four overloaded files. So we now have a theme editor. Well, we'll have. We have a prototype. We're working on it. Of a theme editor, which basically takes all that data, analyzes it. Yeah, you're allowed to clap. You can see this basically analyzes the projects, figures out what's going on. Uh, I can choose between different themes here. And um, I can also make edits. So it's showing me here, for example, that you know, I have a state list here. The checkerboard is telling me that it's trying to show the, you know, the alpha value of the color. Uh, it's showing me how the colors were resolved. And perhaps most importantly, I can use this to actually tweak the colors. So if I open up a color chooser here, oh, well, the screen resolution is not helping. You can see that as I'm tweaking the colors, I can see a live preview of what these, what these widgets will look like with that color. So this should make it a lot easier to, to tweak your themes. All right, uh, last but not least, the layout editor. We are working to completely rewrite it uh, with a lot of new features. Um, so it's early days still, but one of the things we're, we're working on is possibly having a blueprint mode for your layout. So you can sort of see what's going on, and you can sort of work in both modes. Uh, at the same time. Uh, we're integrating the Google Design Library. So for example, I can drag a app bar layout onto this layout. And so, oh, I shouldn't have changed that color to red. That looks so ugly. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm now going to go and pull in, for example, a, didn't I have a, what's the name of the logo? Yeah, there it is. I can pull in an IO logo, which doesn't really work with the red, but fine. Uh, and also a floating action button, which is also red. And when I, when I choose this, you get this beautiful UI right here. You can see before and after. <laughs> so we've had uh, the XML preview mode for a while, whereas you can mostly work in XML and sort of see what's going on on the right. Uh, and we've expanded that recently so that you can now use it for system preferences as well. Uh, so this is a system preference file, and it's just rendered the way the UI is going to look. But one important improvement now is that this is no longer a preview window. This is the layout editor. So I can go over here, and even if while I'm editing, I can instead go over and start dragging things around and make edits. I can even pull in the palette right here locally. The minute I start dragging, the, you know, the palette goes away, and I'm editing the, the layout. So uh, that's the layout editor. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure exactly when, when it's going to be done, uh, but hopefully, hopefully not too long. All right, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jay to wrap up. Thanks. So great, uh, great demos. So what's next? Um, I guess before digging into the specific features, I think it might be helpful to understand how we actually develop Android Studio. So you've probably seen these release channels and thinking about what, what do these channels even mean? Um, for us, we have a series of release channels. So, so today we're launching 1.3 Preview in Canary, which means it's sort of the first release. So then every couple of weeks, we do a series of tests and feedback. And we promote those releases all the way through dev, beta, and to finally the stable. 
And throughout, the, throughout that process, we get your feedback. So if you want to see if something's broken or something needs to be fixed, we actually look at the feedback and make sure it reaches the stable channel when we release the final version of Android Studio. So looking forward, so today we did 1.3, and we're looking at some 1.4, 1.5 features today at the demo. And so if you think about it, basically most of our auto releases are, are more focused on features, and then our even releases are more focused on the polish aspect of the IDE. So again, kind of looking at what's next. So Zav talked about the emulator. So we're definitely, we know we have some work to do, and we're definitely going to focus on that and making sure it's a great performing experience for you to, to do your local testing on. As, as Tor mentioned, we're also really working on the developer service integration. We're, we're initially adding the Google services into that, that flow. We're also opening up to other third-party tools, because we know you use a lot of different tools. We want to make that easy for you to integrate that into your project. And then last, as I mentioned in my previous slide, it's about the polish and performance, really making sure that we you know, provide a great experience for you uh, is, this, is this a part of the flow for us in the Android Studio team. Great, and that's it. So, so please leave feedback for us. Um, we're also asking office hours today from 4 to 5 uh, at the end of the day. And I think it's going to be actually in that side of the building. And then again, leave feedback for us in the app or on the website. So we have maybe three or four minutes for some questions. Uh, before we start questions, we also have uh, today and tomorrow some box talks throughout the playground. Uh, there's some about testing. Uh, there's one about uh, the profiler, the, the memory profiler. Uh, so check the schedule. Uh, they are, usually they're repeated twice. So you can, you can check it when it's convenient for you. And I think they also wanted us to say that after this, we will be outside. So don't, don't talk to us by the stage. We're supposed to go outside for follow-up questions. All right. Question. So earlier, you mentioned uh, automating install of HackSim. Is there any option to automate the setting of the BIOS setting um, in Windows necessary to enable that? Uh, I think that so, would be so what we do. So if we, if we notice in your BIOS that you don't have it set, we actually give you a warning about, hey, you need to, to update that. So 1.3 is actually now a prompt to tell you that you need to actually set that in your BIOS. OK. Thanks. Any thoughts on um, Java 1.8? Java 8? No. Yeah. It, no? The Java 8, the, the, the is that what comes after 7? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a platform issue, right? It's like you have to talk to the platforms. OK. Uh, but we don't have anything to say about that. Um, has there been any changes to the NDK build model? Are we still relying on Android or MK and all that stuff? So the, the integration for uh, in Gradle will replace the Android MK. Uh, Gradle has native support to handle nat you know, uh, native code. All you have to do is tell Gradle where the toolchain is. So we'll basically do the bridge between the toolchain of the NDK are here, uh, and then we tell Gradle, use those toolchain and compile it. Uh, that's so, the, that's oh. the main reason why we couldn't include it in the first preview, was we're still wanting that experimental plugin to be hooked up, because we really don't want to continue that older way. You know the um, issue with the unit tests and the instrumentation tests both being on the path at the same time? You had to f switch the flavor to get them on the path? Uh, oh, in, in Studio? Yeah. Yeah, we are working on that. It's, so it's with the separate module, does that? Does that mean they're both on at the same time uh, if you move them to Well, you, you would, yeah, because it's just a different module. The issue is that uh, Studio does not have a concept of like two test scope that are separate. Uh, so we're working on figuring something out. But if you use a test uh, module, then you could have unit test in your main, te in your main module and the separate test module, and that would work. OK, great. All right, uh, probably. Uh, all right, let's. Yeah. Um, really, really excited about the HProof analysis stuff. Uh, is that thing, the code itself, is that going to be open source? And is the UI code separated from the thing that does the analysis? Uh, yeah, all the UI, I mean, everything except for native, all the, UI, uh, all the stuff in Studio is open source, so it is in there. Thank you. All right. Th thank so you, everyone. Thank uh, we'll be over there, so if you have more questions, we, we'll answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.